Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 495 of the podcast and it is uh, Saturday 27th of June 2020 as I record this. Can you believe we're almost at the half year? (laughs) I know this year has been weird but um, yeah that's crazy. So today I'm talking to Natalie Sisson about building a business around a personal brand, especially over the long term when things inevitably change. Now Natalie used to be the suitcase entrepreneur and it was all about traveling and digital nomad and then settled down in New Zealand so she had to pivot in many ways but her core self obviously remained and many of her tribe followed her to her new branding. So this is something I think about all the time and I try to encourage you guys to think about even when you are just starting out because if you want to build a certain business, if you want to build a career, you have to realize that over time you will change and And you might want to pivot in the future. So you don't want to box yourself in with a brand that doesn't enable you to grow. Uh, Inevitably, things change. That is just life. So we talk about the importance of getting massive clarity on what you want to do and cutting out the extraneous stuff, which is something we have to keep revisiting over time. So that is coming up in the interview. In publishing news this week, the latest Audio Publishers Association report is out. So this is the uh, sort of 2019, cons- oh, 2020 consumer survey and 2019 sales survey. Uh, the press release just came out. So audiobook sales in the US up again, double digit 16%, which is eight straight years of double digit growth. The number of audiobooks listened by per per user has increased. The age of listeners is also dropping. 57% of frequent audiobook listeners are under the age of 45. And it was so funny because uh, last year when I was at Frankfurt and went to the audio summit and they were sort of uh, incredulous that suddenly the audio market had shifted from what they considered to be people who um, you know, obviously there was the blind market, but also the people whose eyesight start going as they get older, of which I am one. I'm, you know, re- wearing my reading glasses. So, uh, you know, th- they've really shifted their idea of what the demographic of audiobook listeners are, which is fantastic. 50% of audiobook listeners say they are making new time to listen to audiobooks and consuming more books. of audiobook purchasers said they would buy an audiobook that is one to three hours long. This is very encouraging, uh, especially if you if you publish audio wide, you can have pricing. The problem, I think, with the one to three hours long, if you have a credit model uh, like the Audible model, is that it doesn't look like a good bargain to get to use a credit on something that's that short. But I can tell you that as um, you know, I'm an Audible user and I will buy shorter audiobooks. I'll, I've also now started buying them on Authors Direct, which is available uh, now in the UK. So um, this is really good. And for nonfiction as well, we write a lot of shorter so that's cool. 60% of respondents own a smart speaker and 46% of those have used it to listen to an audiobook. So that's definitely a growing niche. Also this week, Bookwire held an online conference on audio and publishing perspectives reported on the highlights, saying uh, the coronavirus pandemic has flattened the listening curve, which in normal times is highest around commute schedules and during the work week. Now we see listening done across all weekdays, including Saturday and Sunday, often in shorter bursts, which uh, is really certainly interesting, sort of people's routines being out of uh, whack, but they still want to listen. So that's cool. Uh, Also, binging is a factor. In podcasts, that means listening to three or more episodes in a row and an audiobook 90 minutes or more of listening in a sitting. So, and I certainly recognise my own behaviour in this. Like if I just walk down to the uh, supermarket and back, you know, I might listen to sort of 25 minutes on the way, 25 minutes on the way back. And then uh, if I go for a much longer walk on my own, I'll, I'll definitely listen for 90 minutes or more. 
Uh, transcripts are important in audio work. Goodness, haven't I been saying that for a decade? <laughs> because they make audio visible for search engines. When transcripts are made through automated means, human editing is important, but transcripts raise the discoverability of audio content markedly. Um, yeah, again, I've been doing transcripts for years and yes, it costs some money, but that money has come down a lot and it's definitely well worth it. Uh, Storytel in Sweden says audiobooks are reaching as much as 50% of publishing's revenue there. Um, the importance of good storytelling, exclusivity to Storytel to the platform, personalization and curation for algorithmic recommendations, plus local language content. This is huge because so much of the audio content in the world is not in local languages. So that is going to be a huge boom. If you do write in languages other than English and you're in market, other than English, then uh, please look at how you could potentially do audio in your language, in your market. It might not be massive now, but it's going to continue to grow. Also, the message said, uh, the message was that streaming is inevitable. The future is about learning how to satisfy your customer interest. Your customer wants easy and free in inverted commas. So um, streaming is is selling your books for less, but it is where things are going. You'll only have influence on prices if you join early enough that streaming services are dependent on your content. This was a sort of call to action for the publishing industry. And I want to highlight Spotify again, because I really, I really believe Spotify will make a play for audiobooks. And also you can see it with Netflix, with the, the video world. It used to be that Netflix would license other people. Well, they still do license other people's content for their platform. But increasingly, Netflix makes their own content. So that is obviously what Audible's done, what uh, Storytel's doing. And, you know, they're buying up IP and creating their own um, content so that people stay within the platform. I think Spotify will do the same thing. Uh, it is going to be very interesting. I, I think by 2022, so not next year, but the year after, I think Spotify will make a play for audiobooks. Their recommendation algorithm is, is truly incredible. Uh, I used to, I use search to find audio content all the time on Apple, and they have actually just made the search better, but the Spotify algorithm is definitely superior. Now, ubiquitous audio in streaming, like music, it's definitely going that way. And I think costs for creating audiobooks are going to continue to come down and this will just be a format that's part of the norm and of course more on how to do all this in audio for authors my uh, book uh, which I narrated <laughs> if you want to listen to that uh, okay so given that we're likely to have more AI narration in the next few years moving into futurist stuff Interesting article this week, Fast Company reports that an AI robot trained in method acting will star in a $70 million sci-fi movie. So this is not, I mean, we have had AI stuff in movies, but they've been tiny, short and low, you know, low budget stuff kind of proving a point. This is a bigger budget. Now, $70 million in the world of um, movies is not the biggest amount, but it's still a good, goodly amount of money. Uh, Fast Company says, as Hollywood struggles to figure out how to open up film and TV sets for production as the pandemic rages on, one movie seems to have settled on a partial solution, casting a non-human for a lead role. An AI robot named Erica will star in B, or I presume that's Beta actually, which explores how a scientist who came up with a program to perfect human DNA must help the artificially intelligent woman he created survive in a dangerous world. Now, I think this is interesting and presumably worrying for actors. I mean, we've already seen licensing for digital doubles. Will Smith did that to create his younger self in Gemini Man. Junior, his uh, Will Smith Junior, was a computer generated creation from Weta Digital, founded by Peter Jackson and responsible for characters like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, um, the apes in Planet of the Apes, Thanos, and uh, also some of the Avatar characters. Um, so, it's this, but also, as we know, I mean, um, Gollum was and had Andy Serkis in an actor in a suit, basically. And uh, so it's very interesting how the human actor and the AI extra is going to work. But certainly the Will Smith double in Gemini Man, if you read more about that, it's very, very interesting. And also we've seen a rise in sort of dead 
pop stars and uh i mean even in star wars you've got leia there um which they put in after she had died so this is very interesting seeing how in the creative industries humans will be working with ai tools and again as i always say you know we need to see how that's going to work for us as authors and i believe it's going to help us create more not less and also reach more readers and perhaps you know turn our work into far more exciting things so in my personal update uh, i'm this i'm in sort of still finishing energy on Map of the Impossible. Got my notes back from the proofreader, updated the pre-order files, republished those. This is something you have to do if you do pre-orders, you know, because you might um, publish a just a blank pre-order file at the beginning or no file at all. And then you might put in a placeholder. And then after you've had your proofread, you kind of put up, uh, you can upload the final files up to, what is it, 10 days or something before. But I, I kind of like to get that done as soon as I can. Uh, I did the print update sent to my interior designer. I also, uh, given the audio stuff, I have put Map of Shadows up on Find Away Voices. I will be using a professional narrator for the trilogy. So I've been going backwards and forwards on wanting to narrate it myself. I definitely still want a British female voice, but I feel that I have so much I want to get done this year and I know how much work it is to do a trilogy of audiobooks. So I'm going to you know, I I know it's just not my zone of genius to narrate fiction. I'm going to do my short stories again in the future and I'll do my nonfiction. But um, using professionals for fiction, I think, is the way forward for me. That is um, what I'm going to choose to do. So that is hopefully coming, hopefully by the end of the year. So I've also been doing a lot of speaking. It was funny because, of course, as the pandemic more prevalent and continues to get more prevalent. Uh, There were lots of summits and events that went online and um, I said yes to lots of them and that is now... (laughs) I'm starting to now having to do all those sessions. And the requests are continuing to increase as more and more of these events go online. And so much so that I'm I'm having to say no to a lot of them. And in a very encouraging sign some of them are actually starting to pay. And I wanted to mention this because If an online conference is a paid event, then you should be compensated as a speaker, as you would if you spoke in person. And given that online events are going to become even more prevalent, authors will get asked more to speak. Now, of course, sometimes we will do things for marketing or community reasons, and we won't even ask about getting paid. But the amount, seriously, the amount of time I am spending on doing online events, I, you know, if I keep doing this, I just won't have time to earn money. (laughs) So if you are organising an online event, then consider if it's paid, how can you pay your creatives? And I think that this is something we have to normalise as well, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, this will become more and more normal. And so it should be normal to also pay the people who are providing the content. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, And yeah, I've been very encouraged, actually, by some of the conferences taking this very seriously and wanting to pay their creatives, Uh, but probably still too many who are expecting uh, authors and creatives to do it for free. So just, um, you know, we have to be careful with our time in a world when it goes increasingly digital. And it's so funny because, you know, I I spoke on a um, summit this week who did pay me, of which I was very happy with, and I enjoyed doing the session. But I was just as nervous beforehand. I, you know, I always have to go to the toilet like three times. And I uh, had, you know, sort of bad sleepless night the night before. And, uh, you know, I had to obviously prepare my slides, did a lot of work prepping for it. The actual thing itself was quite stressful. There's almost the added stress of making sure you're there at the right time, especially with time zone differences. There's the uh, getting, making sure the tech is good uh you know I, I there was noise outside so i installed this software to try and reduce my noise cancelling and then i was nervous because i thought oh, what if that doesn't work and so all of those things make it just as difficult to speak uh, at an online conference uh, that and also i find it you know everyone knows now it's just as stressful to be on a zoom <laughs> and sort of tiring to be there not in person. Uh, So anyway, I guess my point is that we should all be prepared for this type of online conference to continue growing 
and more and more people will do them. And so we still have to protect our time, obviously be part of the community, but um, hopefully more events will uh, pay creators. All right. Useful stuff. So I am doing a webinar with the lovely Nick Stevenson coming up in a couple of weeks. Nick is the best email copywriter I know. I continue to try and learn from him. And I, as I'm refocusing on building my fiction email list at the moment, it's really good to revisit the basics. And in fact, I think the pandemic is helping us refocus on what are the basics. And, uh, you know, we can no longer create content for content's sake. We have to have a purpose for all of our marketing activities. And so we will be revisiting the basics in this webinar. Nick will be covering a step-by-step action plan to take your book sales to $1,000 a month. If you are already at $1,000 a month, then it will be about growing your sales even more. We'll be talking about getting traffic, converting that traffic into sales and email subscribers, and then how to use your email list to get reviews, sell your backlist, and how to scale. So uh, Nick is great, um, just fantastic presenter. These webinars are always uh, very popular. So come along and join us. We will also do a Q&A and I know you guys enjoy the banter (laughs) since Nick is a friend we will be bantering Uh, so join us Thursday the 16th of July 8pm UK 3pm US Eastern and if you know join us live but if you register you can also get the replay so come along thecreativepen.com forward slash 16 July 16 July links in the show notes All right. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Uh, Grit Landau says, thanks for this great interview. Loved everything from the hairband fun stuff. I'm a former music journalist to the insights about the merge of Indian traditional book business. Brilliant. Glad you enjoyed that with JD Barker. Uh, Curious Cat Books says, really interesting interview. I wish I was brave enough to approach the authors I look up to in the same way. Me too, Curious Cat. As I said in the interview with JD, I'm like, Maybe I'm just too English. (laughs) Uh, Vivian says, thank you for such an interesting interview. I often don't get to the end of author interviews, but I found this one fascinating and helpful. It must be wonderful to have such wonderful. It must be great to have such wonderful friends, uh, authors as friends as J.D. Barker has. Fantastic. And just a couple more. Stan Dubin says, your podcast with Chris Spizak was for me one of your best shows ever. It was the first show I finished and then went right back to the beginning to listen again. Glad it was useful. And it's so funny because, of course, different interviews resonate with different people at different times of the author journey. So I hope I continue to give you enough variability in the interviews that you enjoy uh, several uh, during a month. I mean, clearly every interview is not for everyone, but, you know, I try to keep them varied. (laughs) and finally Robin Sarti said this trail is my happy place lovely picture of the lake my first opportunity to visit this year I nearly let fear keep me away instead I listened to the creative pen podcast and ventured forth no regrets did look gorgeous Robin so glad you're back out again Okay, so today's show is sponsored by my own mini course your author business plan which uh, is is uh, doing really well actually I'm so happy people are really finding it useful it will help you create a roadmap to take you from where you are to where you want to be as an author and since we are at the half year that's why I wanted to talk about it we need to try and reclaim the second half of this year like the pandemic is not over and in fact I don't know wherever you are in the world it's a weird time uh, but it's certainly not over lockdown might be over here in the UK well in England (laughs) But it's uh, certainly very strange. And I feel like I want to reclaim the next six months and get a lot done. So perhaps you're also thinking about what you want to do going forward, not just for the next six months, but for the next year, five years, whatever. Also what you want to get rid of, what you want to change. And this uh, mini course, it really is a mini course, it will help you reassess. It's more of a strategic exercise with lots of questions rather than a load of tips. I also talk about my own uh, thinking around reassessing my author business. It's for fiction and non-fiction. It's for self published indie authors and also for traditionally published authors and also for hybrid it's very much uh, full of sort of these questions you get a 
a template business plan. You, w- there are videos on why you need a business plan, um, the elements of an effective business plan, the questions you need to answer, and how to turn that plan into action. You'll get a consolidated question list and also my template asset master list for trapping, trapping, <laughs> tracking your books. And don't worry, this is not a spreadsheet tastic course. You can do a one pager with a picture if you want, and I share my own one. So this is a creative business plan mini course. It's only 99 US dollars. And of course, if you're a patron or you a member of my courses in general, you get a discount. Rachel says, just completed your author business plan mini course. I literally gasped as I wrote my business summary. So many aha moments. The course helped me understand where I am now as an author and where I want to be. Thank you, Rachel. Glad you enjoyed it. Okay, you can uh, go and check out the course at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn and you will find the courses there. So that is your author business plan. So this type of corporate sponsorship or my own promotions help pay for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I did the Q&A last week. That was uh good and of course if you join the show and uh, support the show you get the extra Q&A every month thanks to new patrons Stephen, Jessica Lancaster Janet Brantley and Sitcom Geeks I love my patrons and I really appreciate your support. It demonstrates you still find the show useful and want it to continue. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and you'll get the extra Q&A audio, including the backlist. So support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Natalie Sisson is a New Zealand entrepreneur, author, speaker, host of the Untapped podcast and triathlete. Her books include The Suitcase Entrepreneur and The Freedom Plan. Redesign your business to work less, earn more and be free. Welcome, Natalie. Oh, I'm so excited to be here with you, Joanna. Oh, it's great to connect. Uh, So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how writing became part of your scalable business. It became part of my business when I finally realized I was I had a book in me, which I'm sure a lot of listeners are like, when is that moment going to happen? But for me, that was around 2012. I'd been the suitcase entrepreneur for a couple of years, and I finally felt like I had something worth writing. So I had a community behind me and a book that was worth birthing. And in 2013, that's what came out. And when you say worth writing, because mm. you were blogging for a number of years before you wrote a book. So how did you know yeah. when you, when to go from blog post into book? Well, I've been turning a lot of my blog posts into like digital paid books or into opt-ins or freebie guides. But I feel like it was probably about three or four years experience of being the suitcase entrepreneur and helping people create freedom in business and adventure in life is my tagline. And I felt like I actually had enough, I guess, knowledge as a leading learner. I don't love the word expert, but I felt like I was a leading learner who had enough knowledge that would be really worthy of being in a book. And I had enough people sort of saying, are you going to write a book? Which was a bit of a sign to me that, oh, finally, maybe this childhood dream would come true. And the final thing I think that was very obvious to me was there were very few women digital nomads at the time and who were writing books. And I felt like there were just a lot of men talking about it. And I was like, wait a minute, there's heaps of women out there who could be doing this or would like to be doing this and they need another perspective. Oh, no, that's great. You did mention their childhood dream. So that implies, yeah. yeah. So tell me about that. (laughs) Did you always want to write a book? I think I did, but it it was really funny, Joanna, because when you're a kid, for sure, I'm sure a lot of people think about it. I always wrote in school. I love being on the school magazine. I wrote journals from like age 11 to 18 nonstop. And I just loved writing. And I think way back then, I did actually think, oh, it'd be really cool to write a book one day, as I think a lot of people think about. And I loved reading books. But then when it came around to about this 2012, I was like, oh, I could I could actually write this book. I feel like it's something that I I left behind and then regained around that time going, actually, this is something I'd always wanted to do deep down. 
Mm. And then what was the process of of turning your existing material into a book? Because I feel like many bloggers particularly, or many people listening, if they're doing nonfiction, they might be speakers, they might be teachers in some way. So you've got this mass of material. How do you turn that into a book that your audience uh, want? Yeah, do you know the really funny thing about this is I, 95% of the suitcase entrepreneur I wrote from scratch, which is hilarious because I had about, I don't know, six or 700 blog posts by that time. But I feel like I just wanted it to come fresh out of my brain with the most up-to-date experience and knowledge and know-how that I had. And so it just felt really good to just write from scratch because I think book writing can be really cathartic, especially when you're putting your your sort of frameworks and your experience into a book. It's actually a really cool process to solidify what you actually know you're talking about. So I think I only took one little bit from a blog uh, and the rest I literally wrote from scratch. And I'm sure I've talked about it heaps on interviews and I'd written about it a lot and I'd shared it on videos, but to write it down from the beginning was a really cool process. I actually really glad you said that because I think the biggest problem with the bloggers turned authors is that they think all they have to do is pick a few blog posts and put them in book form and Mm. that's enough. But I feel like the book is a completely different journey to uh, the blog model because I'm not going to come to your blog and read all of your stuff in order. (laughs) just just Mm. not going to happen right whereas I now I mean how I find people is if I hear an interview like this then I'll go buy their book and I expect that book to be the encapsulation of everything they've learned so I'm so glad Mm. you said that because it's a lot more work to start from scratch but equally you perhaps have delivered something that that does encapsulate years worth of work yeah it, it is true. And I'm, for example, I'm actually writing a book right now, my third book, and I'm taking little bits from my vlogs or my podcast. And I'm finding that quite interesting because my manuscript is a mess right now because the ideas behind those vlogs and podcasts are really good. But now I almost have to rewrite the idea, if that makes sense. But it is quite nice to start with something. But I wonder if the clean slate was actually what made the suitcase entrepreneur, you know, a great book. I'm not going to lie. I think I was really proud of how it came out because it was so from the heart and and really thinking through and making sure that what I was writing was legit and helpful and practical and and honest. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. And and of course, we all refine our process. We'll come back to that other book a bit later. Mm. But I want to talk about because of course, you do have um, several books, as we mentioned, but they are only one part of your business model. I know Mm. you're a a great um, businesswoman. And I think you would laugh if if it was suggested that you would make uh, just a full time income from those book sales alone. (laughs) Yes, yes, I've never, yeah, exactly. I used to think that books are really profitable, but it's, I love the phrase beyond the book. So, you know, the book is a, is a calling card. It's a kind of way of saying, hey, you know, I've got some thought leadership here. I've got some interesting um, perspectives around this topic. I've got a lot of experience in it, but that's just the beginning. And, you know, I don't know how many books you've read, Joanna, probably heaps, but I always find I get to the end of that book and you often want more because it sparked this kernel of curiosity and interest in you. It's made you think outside the box or just differently about a topic. And then it's the perfect opportunity for that author to go, hey, you know, you want to learn more now, come follow me here or do this little course or, you know, maybe buy this next thing to continue the journey. Because as they evolve, you evolve as well. It's just like, it's a really fascinating thing. Mm. And so there's just so much you can do beyond the book. Mm. So tell us about that. What what are your multiple streams of income and what does your business ecosystem look like? Actually, I'd, I'd love to share because how the Suitcase Entrepreneur book came around is a perfect example of the book and digital product and course journey because I started off with a 12-part blog post series on my blog called Build Your Online Business. I turned that into a paid ebook, even though it was free on the site and I told people that. They, they paid to have it in a consumable format. And then I worked that Build Your Online Business. I just I worked through it with my coaching clients and I took the principles and frameworks from that for years. And then I wrote The Suitcase Entrepreneur based off all those principles that I'd done. And then off the back of The Suitcase Entrepreneur, I actually created my most profitable course to date called The Freedom Plan. And then I ran that for several years. It was an amazing course. And then I put a lot of the key principles, not everything, but some of the key principles and the learnings from running that as a course into the book, The Freedom Plan, which was the next one. So I just thought I'd point that out as a really interesting journey of how I feel like content and your your philosophies and your theories and your frameworks can keep 
growing as you do in different formats. And then I, I mean, I make uh, quite a bit of income from affiliate sales. I mm-hmm. wondered if, and that was a model that came out of the blogging movement yes. uh, as, as where, where we were. Is that something that's still part of your business? You make it sound like the blogging movement's over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll come yeah, back to that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So I actually had a great question. So I had eight revenue streams. Uh, My book was one of them. Uh, Podcast sponsorships was another. Affiliate sales was for sure another. Uh, Digital products on my site, online courses on my site, speaking and uh, group coaching slash live programs and events and workshops, retreats and workshops. Is that, that's around, yeah, eight or nine. It was, it felt like a lot, but they all kind of came out of one another and naturally, you know, sort of spun off each other and I think that was a really neat thing and I do think it's a really smart idea to have multiple revenue streams so long as they all align and make sense in your kind of customer journey and that ascension model so to speak so that the customer can grow with you. And I think I like the word ecosystem because all of these things kind of pull people into your ecosystem and then they can consume bits of you however they like, you know, in a weird <laughs> metaphor. But let's come back on that. Is the blogging movement over? Because this is something I, I have actually been thinking a lot about. I, I, As a consumer, I haven't read, I don't read blog posts anymore. I've been for the last probably four years, I, I, I'm a audio first consumer. I listen to a lot of podcasts at sort of 1.5 speed I listen to audiobooks I still read books but I I rarely will read a blog post so I wondered and you mentioned vlogging you've got a podcast um I wondered how much has blogging changed in terms of text on a website on a regular format or are you choosing other forms of marketing it's a really fascinating question because if I think about it I don't blog much anymore I podcast and the blog post from that but it's usually shorter and I, I vlog, and I'm about to get back into doing it consistently, and I do Facebook Live. So I'm still producing a lot of content, but the actual blog used to just take so long. And actually writing a book again now is making me appreciate what an art and skill it is. So, yeah, I think the form of blogging has changed, and I definitely hear you on consuming more audio content. But at the end of the day, I guess it's still content creation, and there are some blogs. You know, I think of somebody like James Clear, who is just a writer through and through. I don't believe he has a podcast, or maybe he did start one, but he doesn't do videos, so to speak, and he writes all the time. Another person would be Mark Manson, who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving. You know, he's a writer through and through as well. So I think if you, for the really established people, it is still the way that people love to consume their content. But I'm a big fan of understanding my audience and how they want to consume content. And my audience is entrepreneurs who are growing their business and and creating a great lifestyle and they're kind of you know they're fulfilled proactive I will say busy even though I don't love that word and so for them audio or video is just a a better way of doing it than sitting back and taking a long read so it is an interesting thing actually I guess that the form of blogging has changed over the years but the art of it still lives on it's a bit like podcast you said you started yours in 2008 2009 which is amazing and I remember when I started mine in 2012 I thought I'd missed the boat in fact when I thought when I started my blog in 2008 I thought I'd missed the blogging boat and now yet there are still people starting (laughs) podcasts there are still people starting blogs so I feel like at the end of the day it's up to you to create the platform and and make it unique to yourself and do your best with it yeah, I agree. And partly it's what we like to consume, but also what we like to produce. And for me, mm-hmm. I like to produce words that go into books and books are, you know, mm-hmm. my sort of primary product. But let's talk about freedom because um, freedom is my number one value. So I really resonate with, <laughs> with you in, in saying the same thing. And, and you've got the book, The Freedom Plan, and you talk about streamlining business because it's so important. I feel like often people listening might now feel, oh, if, if I want to be like Natalie, I have to do video, I have to do vlogging, I have to do all that I have to do Facebook Live, but actually you talk about sort of streamlining business and getting rid of the overwhelm with to-do lists. So how can people move towards that freedom and cut out the things that aren't going to work or that they don't really want to do? For me, it's about getting massive clarity on what you want to do and cutting out all the extraneous stuff. And that comes from having clarity on your freedom values and what that means to you. So one of the ways, and I think I talk about it in the Freedom Plan and also in the course, is about actually visualizing 
your perfect day. And it may sound a little bit weird to people, but as I was working with clients over the years, I'd often used to say, well, if you could have the perfect business and you could wake up every morning, what would that look like? And the amount of people who told me, oh, I don't actually know. I've never thought about what my perfect day would look like from start to finish. And I was like, well, how many hours would you work? And where would you be working? And what would you be working on? And then who would you be spending your time with? And how would you take time out? And what would you do to have fun and relax? And where would you be in the world? And suddenly, it just, it, you know, even I hadn't done it to that extreme at that point. And it was fascinating because the minute you even just take a moment, 30 minutes to write out what your perfect day would look like, even if it, you don't think it's possible right now, it's incredible how it really aligns you with, oh, I didn't realize this was so important to me that I have a slow start in the morning or that I um, take a lot of time out or that I stop work at two or that I'm only doing this kind of work that lights me up. And from there, I think you get real clarity and alignment on, okay, well, why am I doing all this other stuff, which uh, saps my energy, which makes me frustrated, which I, makes me the bottleneck of my business or my day. So how do I outsource that? How do I eliminate it? What do I focus on to just be happy, do the things I love and earn great money? And I know it sounds really simple, but it honestly is. It's about cutting out all the stuff that doesn't serve you and focusing on the stuff that you do super well that brings you the most value and makes the most impact. Mm. It's interesting. And I wonder, I mean, as we record this, obviously the world's going through this weird pandemic at time. And um, as we record this, New Zealand is starting to come out of lockdown. In the UK, we're still really in it. But do you think mm. this time of pandemic, where a lot of people have been reflecting on, one, the shortness of life, but also mm -hmm. on what perhaps what they really want, do you think we're going to see a big shift coming out of this? <sighs> I was going to say I really hope so, Joanna, but, but humans are creatures of habit and I feel like a lot of people will go back to what they did. I'm, what I'm really hoping is that people take the bits that they loved out of lockdown, if they did love anything. For me, it's actually been one of the most fulfilling, productive and peaceful times in my life because I didn't have all these other things going on and I'm really holding on to almost staying in a bit of a lockdown mode which sounds odd because I'm an extrovert and I love people but I've really valued the simplicity that came out of of cooking for yourself every day of being with your partner we don't have kids so we're quite lucky we just had our dogs we had a lot of land and nature and I it made me appreciate how much extra stuff I was doing just to be and socialize and do things and go into town and I really hope that people kind of look at the stuff that worked really well for them during this time, where they found peace, where they found gratitude and love and, you know, maybe quality time with people and their family and keep that part on, especially, I would have to say, on the remote work side, working from home, working online. Like, I feel like finally a lot of people around the world have caught up to what digital nomads and online business owners have been doing for years. So I, I hope that people take something out of it that actually worked for them and keep it as a ritual in their life. Otherwise, it feels like it's a lesson we didn't learn. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've certainly felt like I've had some time away to reflect on what I really want and I always like the memento mori I spend a lot of time going to graveyards anyway but this is this is given you know you've suddenly realized what what can happen quite quickly but so you, you mentioned remote working there in you're obviously you're in New Zealand you've been traveling you know for many years but you you're home now in in New Zealand mm -hmm. and I feel like so much of what happens or, that we've been involved with over many years is US centric so and maybe mm -hmm. as you say things have shifted now because people are going to be used to it but if people want to run a global online business as we do and they want to be less US centric what is what are some of your tips for that I mean are are there other communities? I know there used to be a really big sort of Australian, New Zealand blogger community. Are there the big networks outside of the US? Yeah, for sure. And I think um, it's interesting you say that because I started my business in Canada and then a, a huge part of my business and customer base and community was in the US. But as a suitcase entrepreneur, when I was traveling around the world, everywhere I went, I'd pick up more community members. So my audience has always been international. And I've actually stayed away when I was blogging or vlogging or whatever I was doing. If somebody came to me with something that was just US focused, I'd say no, because I'm like, no, my audience is from everywhere. They really are. And so I feel like there's communities all over the world. And yes, some of them are at different stages in development, but 
there's, you know, Asia Pacific is so gung ho in terms of being ahead on the virtual identity space, I guess, and just almost being birthed into remote entrepreneurship and remote working and working online. So I feel like they kind of embrace that early on. There's a ton of digital nomads around the world who hang out in Asia Pacific because it's cheap and you can live like a king or queen. Then there's the European side where people have been hanging out in hubs like Berlin and Lisbon, where it really started to become hubs as well for entrepreneurs. So yeah, I guess I've always had the international focus. And even when I came back to New Zealand, I'd often be speaking to people and I'd be like, oh, they'd be like, oh, that'd be great in Wellington. I'd be like, Wellington? No, I was thinking the world. Like I've never, <laughs> I've just never limited to one thing. So I guess it's your sphere of influence, right? Like what, what you put in within your sphere of influence and how you adapt to that. And I think there are hubs and communities all over the world. You just have to seek them out. Mm. I guess I'm coming from a lot. I get a really common question because I'm like you. I'm very internationally focused. Yeah. Um, but it, I, the question I get from Americans and there are a lot of Americans listening is how do I market to people who are not in America? So what are your thoughts? on? Yeah, that? it's a fascinating one, actually, because I get quite a lot of clients and customers who like me because I'm not American and I don't want to offend your audience by any means. But <laughs> there's a different way of, of marketing to and resonating with people. And, and down under where I'm, you know, New Zealand, Australia, we're quite laid back and quite humble often probably a little bit different outside of that. But I feel like a lot of the American or Canadian sort of thing just doesn't resonate or sit well here. So I guess actually it depends for those in the US, you know, how much do you want to reach out and understand and learn about other cultures and how can you bring what you know into their culture so that it makes it more relevant? Obviously, travel is huge for that. I feel like travel really levels the playing field and allows you to understand where people are coming from in their own world. But I, I do think it, it really requires more reading, more conversations with people overseas, getting to know them and going outside your sphere of influence right now. And also looking for hubs where the things that are happening that you're interested in, you know, like where is the sustainability or the climate change or the space engineering kind of, where is it outside of the US happening that you can tap into those hubs and communities and smart people? So I think it's really for me about seeking out what you're interested in and then who are the go-to people talking about that and looking outside of the US. I think podcasts are really sometimes a good thing for that, especially if you can tune into international ones, communities, forums, groups. And it just takes a bit of effort, but there's so many people around the world doing amazing things. They just don't necessarily yell it as loud or have as much attention. So it's about a bit more detective work, I think. And I always say to people as well, look, anything you put online, like this podcast is, uh, is being downloaded in 222 countries, which, you know, hello, everyone, you know, it's is, amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is in incredible. And the, the fact is, anything you put online that is not locked down into a jurisdiction is available to people all over the world. And, and we're very lucky with English that a lot of people, you know, want want to learn English and, and do business in English. So that's another point, isn't it, really, is this anything you put online? <laughs> yeah. is, is accessible and actually you brought up another great point there like for example Brazil I also know is super entrepreneurial and they're doing some amazing things over there and I often think about languages like my book The Suitcase Entrepreneur I got a Japanese deal for that actually and it was a really I never thought that book would necessarily fly in Japan, but it's done quite well because people are looking for freedom over there and freedom in different ways. And it was quite out of the box for them and really interesting. So I know Neil Patel, for example, who's an SEO specialist, he does a ton of different language versions of his website and he's seeing incredible growth from putting it into different languages and um, getting it out around the world. He does adverts to different languages and countries around the world. And so I really think it depends how far you want to take it <laughs> and whether you can use people in your community in a positive way to say, hey, would you be willing to translate this or this podcast or this blog post or this book? There's just different ways to be able to reach people for sure. Mm, absolutely. So um, just coming back to the sort of uh, remote working and sort of global focus and productivity, because freedom is one thing. And one of the things uh, that in order to have more freedom is having better systems, better potentially outsourcing. And you I love that you say on I think on your actual on your website that you're a systems geek, um, which <laughs> is great. So I wonder, like, what are some of the systems that you use um, in your business? 
Yeah, and I just want to say to that, I feel like as a freedom seeker, I oft, I took a long time to figure out that discipline and systems lead to more freedom. It's ironic, but I just wanted to put that out there in case other people are like going, what? Some of the systems, I think, is just about looking for efficiency. So where am I turning up every single day doing something, even if I love it, where I'm repeating the same process over and over and especially in an online business with all these different moving parts and revenue streams, there's a lot of need for efficiency in what you do um, and how you duplicate things, how you replicate things, how you repurpose content, how you manage your time. So I'm a big one for um, a couple of things, actually, having, I call them sexy operating procedures, but, you know, standard operating procedures where you actually document every single move out that it takes for you to do one particular thing. So maybe an online launch or producing your podcast and you document out from woe to go, like how that gets done so that anybody could come along into your business that you hire or outsource to, or if you got sick and somebody need to take it over, read that SOP and get it pretty much right on the first go, which is an incredible thing. Yes, it, it takes time, but if you're doing it every single day, day in, day out, or if you're doing it once a week even, and it's quite intensive, it's one of the smartest things is to look for what's taking the most time in your business where you can start removing yourself, speed it up and make it efficient, and then start doing that for every area of your business. And it's been fascinating to, to do that over the years and just see where we become more efficient so I can spend more of my time doing the things I love, which is creating content, teaching, educating, and coaching. And my small but humble team can do all that stuff to make it run really smoothly. And it just gives me back so much more energy and puts me back in my zone of genius, so to speak. And it, and it makes them feel good because they're improving things all the time. So I do say just start with the thing that's taking up the most time for you right now and look at the way you can kind of fire yourself from doing it bit by bit um, and then start to take over the rest of your business and do that in these pockets, especially for things that are important but need to be done well. Mm. And I, I think the biggest, and I remember it was around 2015 when I, I was like, I have to, I have to get help. I have to get help. I just can't do it all myself. But there is this moment, isn't there, of, and I feel like many of the listeners are very, very busy with the busy work, you know, with book marketing, there's a lot of very busy work. When, when do you reach that moment? How do people know when they have to get help? And is it, is there a tipping point, do you think, or how can people identify those feelings that will get them over the hump of actually having to pay someone else, which is a big, a big step for many people? Yeah, it is. But you know, I don't, I don't feel like it should be anymore. In hindsight, it's a brilliant thing for me to be able to preach from here. But I think the point, the tipping point is when you realize that you are no longer in love with what you're doing or it's become such a stress or strain because you're doing it all. That's a great tipping point. Um, a second one is when you realize that you are paying yourself so little, like if you actually add up how many hours you are spending in a, in a week working and what you're actually making and you I love so weird. Yeah, I know. It was it start, was starting to cut out and then it kind of went. But that's okay. I got the first tipping point. Uh, we're almost done anyway, so let's I'm so uh... sorry. Oh no, no, yeah. don't you know these... I remember where I was. So Okay, um, cool. So I the second about, tipping like, point. If you're a... Yeah, perfect. Oh wait, hang on a minute. Yes. So the second so the first tipping point was if you're just not loving it anymore. Yes. Wasn't it? I yeah. think it was. Okay, cool. And the second tipping point realize that oh sorry. The second tipping point is when you realize that you could actually be earning more if you were in a job versus having maybe your own freelance career or a business. When you work out that your hourly rate is so little compared to the amount of hours that you're putting in. And I think that's a great time to go, gosh, I need to be outsourcing. If I could take somebody on that costs $20 an hour to do these administrative tasks or these parts, then I get to charge myself out at $50 an hour doing the things that I love. So I think that's often a really, really, really good point as well. And that for me, my tipping point was when I realized I was going to go on a bike trip down Africa for two months and I needed to reverse engineer how to have my business continuing without me. So removing myself as the bottleneck and hiring a VA within two weeks and showing her how to do everything that she could bar all the things that I did really well. 
those are some great tips and I I I'm I still haven't reached that point of going away for two months <laughs> but that is my aim I have a, I have a plan uh, so that's great but I also wanted to ask you because I you know I first became aware of you when we both got started in sort of 2008 2009 and there are many of us who started back then but a few only a few really who have remained as, as far as I can see you know of the people I remember mm. being around so I wondered like what are your tips for building a long-term career that still allows you to change because I feel like people some people left because they didn't fit in the box they'd made for themselves anymore so how can Mm. we both have a long-term career but also change such a fantastic question I almost want to do an audit of all the people who were around when we started because it would be curious to know where they are and what they did but for me I kind of I view myself a little bit sometimes like Madonna not that I'm comparing myself to her but she's the queen of she's the queen of reinvention and she's you know she's in her 60s now is it and Mm. she's just continues to remain relevant and I feel like you have to adapt or die it kind of sounds terrible so unless you want to completely change uh Uh, what you're doing and go into a whole new industry or realm. For me, it's about adapting, being resilient, but also following the things that you love and continuing to experiment and stay curious. And when I came back to New Zealand after being the identity of the suitcase entrepreneur for close to eight or nine years, it was a real 180 degree flip for me, Joanna. It was It took me about two years to kind of find my feet and figure out what I wanted to do next. But I did come back to the things that I still loved and I just shifted them under my own brand name and expanded my audience and my sort of repertoire of what I now wanted to teach and what I wanted to become a leading learner. And so I feel like that was a massive reinvention and I continue to reinvent and I'm sure in a few years time it'll be different again. But if you're not reinventing, I feel like you're not growing. So maybe some of those people just decided to do something completely different because they didn't see the longevity, whereas I feel consistency is the key to growth and success. Yeah, and I think it's great that you were able to rebrand um, basically under your name, right? Because your name doesn't change and you can mm-hmm. change, but your brand doesn't. And I, I think with the Creative Pen was actually my third blog. Because, mm. And the others, I just went by the wayside because uh, they were not, I couldn't sustain them. Whereas I feel like I could do many, many things under the Creative Pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really can. It's a great yeah. name. I always thought it was. So it's a, it, that is a tip for people, you know, because mm. as you said, the suitcase entrepreneur was a definition. And as soon as you mm-hmm. wanted to settle down, that became difficult. But you know, it, you. I think you did a great pivot. So I, before we finish, I did want to ask about the new book you have in the works. Yeah. Tell us about that <laughs> and also about your publishing model and how your publishing journey has changed. Well, first off, thank you for making me realise that it needs a comma in the title. So it's called Suck It Up, Princess. And uh, (laughs) thanks so much for bringing that to my attention when you wrote that in the email. Oh, my gosh. It's quite an interesting book because it's going to be completely different. The previous two were both with a massive business focus and lifestyle design, but very practical tools based and case studies, etc. And this one is actually much more, I would say, it's almost like part memoir, part personal growth book and for me it's actually stepping outside that zone a little bit and it's going to be it's it's been more challenging to write to be honest because I'm talking about imposter syndrome and your inner critic and fear and all the great juicy topics that we all deal with but from stories and um, analogies and also I guess experiences that I've had which makes it a lot more vulnerable and yeah it's just it's an interesting change of path a little bit but it just called to me one day And I felt like it's something that I really wanted to write. And the publishing model is interesting because, do you know, I've actually done, I feel like I've done the three main ones now, so to speak. I know there are more, but I've done self-publishing with the Suitcase Entrepreneur. I've done hybrid publishing with the Freedom Plan. And then I've also done traditional publishing when I was trying to get a publisher for the Freedom Plan. And Simon and Schuster came to me and said, can we republish the Suitcase Entrepreneur? which is really fascinating. So for this, I'm actually pretty certain that I'm going back to self-publishing because of freedom and the absolute freedom that you have over your full copyright of your book, the everything, you know, you can control everything in a way. And I do really love that freedom to be able to do what I want with it in terms of the design and the format and what's included in it and the pricing and the ways in which I can go beyond the book. And also just because it's really fun, actually. And I feel like now more than ever, we have the tools and we have the ability to be our own publishing houses. And so why not? Like, as you know, with all the book marketers listening into this, 
book marketing is probably the number one talent that you need outside of being able to write a book. And the big traditional publishers don't really help with that in my experience and through a lot of other authors and friends. So if you can do so much of that on your own and you have the community behind you, then I feel like you've got a really good shot at making your book a success. That is fantastic. So when can we expect that book? Well, this is a very good question. At this point, at, at the earliest would be October of this year, but it does depend on um, how I write the manuscript and how it comes along and time-wise. But I really wanted to get this one out more quickly. Maybe it was partly fueled by the pandemic and I feel like people could really read this right now, but also because with my previous book, I felt like it it came out too late or it took too long because the other book got ahead of it with the traditional publisher. So I really want to make sure I... Um, get this into the hands of the people who've already pre-ordered it through my crowdfunding campaign. Fantastic. So tell us, where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Ooh, well, I'd love for them. I'm pretty much anywhere where Natalie Sisson is. So I've managed to brand myself all over the interwebs. But NatalieSisson.com is a great space to come say hi and at Natalie Sisson on Instagram. And of course, I'd love for them to come listen in to the Untapped podcast, which is where I talk about how to tap into your potential and get paid to be you. And we do cover off on books from time to time. But if you can search for that in iTunes and Stitcher and all the good places, I'd be honoured. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Natalie. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. So I hope you found the interview with Natalie interesting and that it gave you some ideas for what you want your creative business to look like and how you can continue to grow it for the long term. Next week, I'm talking to Marion Roach-Smith about how to write and market memoir, plus building a creative business around a non-fiction book. And Marion is fantastic. She's also got this lovely, relaxing voice. So that will be uh, next week. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.